People are, are messy, um, sometimes difficult to deal with, but also challenging and rewarding in, in, in lots of amazing ways. Uh, building a team can be, can be hard. It can be uh, easy sometimes. The hard times, uh, I think, are, are the ones that we, we learn the most from. And Marnie is here to talk to us today about building teams and, and how we shape uh, those teams to be diverse uh, and to support uh, those, those teams. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and introduce uh, Marnie up here. Hey, is this? Yeah. Can you hear me all right? Cool. Yeah? Good. Okay. Hi, this is, I'm Marnie. This is my first time public speaking, so if I talk really fast or vomit, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> yeah. So I'm not here to talk about why we need more women in tech. I believe that you're all here because you know there's a problem, that there are these nuances in the tech industry and tech culture that are actively pushing women out. And I'm hoping you're all here because you want to be a part of the solution. And I'm here to talk about what those nuances look like, what, how it's not the same for all women. So not all the nuances will look the same, so not all of the ally work will look the same. And it's not easy. I mean, culture isn't break-fix work. We can't just treat our coworkers like servers. You can't SSH your coworker and restart them if they say something offensive. You can't just grep a previous dialogue for a bad joke. You can't just type, brew install feminism, and expect that to work. Also, heads up, this is all on Git. I will let you know how to access it later. I'm sorry, the font is really small. So, welcome to Mansplaining 101, Sysadmin Edition. My name is Marnie Cohen, and I am a business systems developer at Puppet Labs. And that makes me a woman in tech. Actually, a lot of things make me a woman in tech, not just at work. Outside of work, I build my own video games. I help my friends with their computer problems from repairing damaged hard drives to website help, front end or back end. I mean, to my tech illiterate friends, I'm a computer genius. But at work, I don't feel like one. And the longer I'm in the tech industry, the more I realize I'm not alone. These nuances in tech culture are keeping women from being represented and feeling represented and being acknowledged for their accomplishments. So I decided to learn more about it. I sent out a questionnaire to women in tech and it crossed the you know, Twitter, Facebook, community channels. And in two days I received 75 responses full of personal stories and I closed it down because that was more than enough for me to start with. I mean, I wanted to be able to give voice to all of these women and gender minorities that had shared all this personal stuff with me. So I decided to share them with you. So here's a key. Whenever you see a scroll, gosh, that is so tiny. Oh, that's just going to, no. All right. Whenever you see a scroll, that is one woman or gender minority's experience in the tech industry. And I want to start with this one, which said, I've had some people openly stare at my chest, but since I recognize it as just clear social awkwardness instead of bad intent, I am okay with it. I want to start with this quote because it just, ugh, it just makes me feel really gross inside. <laughs> I mean, this isn't appropriate. This isn't okay. This complacency shouldn't exist. I mean, women shouldn't have to just be okay with this sort of behavior. And what does that say about other women entering the industry? And this person's not alone. There were a lot of responses like this. And again, this will be online later. If you don't have a chance to read it, or if it's really tiny, there will be opportunities. A coworker of mine is constantly referring to me as mom, which is very derogatory. I spent six years in the industry before I had another woman as a coworker. Can you imagine that? Have you ever met a guy who spent six years in the tech industry and never had another male coworker? I would love to meet that guy. That would be super interesting. Assumptions I'm a receptionist when I'm just standing near a desk. All right, so we have a lot to talk about. Here's a little progress bar to kind of give you an idea of where we're going to go with this. We're pretty much all the way through the intro. Next, I want to talk about semantics, the language that we use when talking about oppression. We're going to talk about words like mansplaining, talk about gender terms like cis and trans, 
talk about microaggressions and ally. And then we're going to look at syntax. So we can define these words, but what does it look like in day-to-day -day workplace? What does mansplaining look like? How do you identify when you are mansplaining? And then I want to talk about how to apply the ideologies of open source communities to feminism, to improving the tech industry for all minorities with a focus on women and gender minorities. And I say all minorities because not all women are white, not all women are able-bodied, not all women are neurotypical. So if you want to play, make the tech industry better for women, you have to make it better for all women. So let's get started with semantics, the language that we use. Before I joined the tech industry, I was an English major. And in English, you can have a word spelled 20 different ways. Still means the same thing, pretty much. In tech, you can't do that. You need to use the right word in the correct way, or else the computer has no idea what's going on. And feminism's kind of similar. It's not as rigid. But you want to use the correct term to line up your intent with your impact. I mean, we usually don't intend to fuck up, but how do we avoid that? So the first word I want to talk about is mansplaining. It's the false assumption that you don't know what you're doing. It's when you're out camping, and it's your job to build a fire, and it becomes someone else's job to tell you exactly how to build that fire. And I mean, you, you know, you gotta have dry kindling. You gotta make sure it's in a little TP-shaped cone thing so the airflow goes through and the coals get real hot. You just wanna tell this person you know how to build a fire. This isn't your first camping trip. This isn't your first program. It's not your first database. You know exactly what you're doing. And the term is still pretty new. It was coined in an essay called Men Explain Things to Me by Rebecca Solnit, which didn't actually use the term, but it's a really good read. And it's now a collection of essays about feminism. If this is anything interesting to you, I super recommend this book. It's very short. You can read it on the flight. If you're flying back to Oregon like me, you can read it on the flight like five times. And mansplaining is not intentional. That's it's usually not intentional. It's a subconscious thing, and it's not just for men. Women mansplain, everyone mansplains. It's just, it happens. But it's generally the majority to the minority. So white people mansplain to people of color, able-bodied people mansplain to disabled people, so on. And mansplaining is the tip of the iceberg, known as microaggressions. Uh, I can't spell, doesn't matter. It'll still go to the next slide. <laughs> Microaggressions are the everyday incidences that occur based on perceived identities. Microaggressions are mansplaining. They're like this. Uh, a message to the majority. Stop treating conferences like a dating pool. Stop assuming the whole room is male in your presentation. Stop being surprised at me being present and pointing me out. All right, we got a lady in here. It's the absolute goddamn worst. Believe it or not, but there's a place between alienating and ignoring that exists. These are all microaggressions. Microaggressions are when you are reading tech writing and uh, the, it's only male pronouns. The audience is assumed male, as if a woman would never pick up and read some tech writing ever, or even board game manuals. I see that all the time. It's, Microaggressions are that whole list at the beginning of like standing near a front desk and having a you know being mistaken for a receptionist because you're standing near a front desk. Microaggressions are when a recruiter tells you that they are actively recruiting females, so you're never going to know if you're hired for being a woman or for being technical. Microaggressions are hard because they're so little, but that makes them much more powerful because you can't just take them to HR and say, oh, someone said this thing that kind of has just been in the back of my head and it's, it's rough. They add up and each time one happens, it just builds onto the next one. And the problem with that is that once you are pushed down by a microaggression, this thing called imposter syndrome can keep you down. Man, imposter syndrome. So, Imposter syndrome is when you feel like you're a fraud and like one day everyone's going to figure out that you have no idea what you're doing. They're just going to bust down the door and fire you or take you away or all laugh and point at you. Just totally embarrass you. 
and everyone feels it to some degree. But for oppressed classes, it's especially damaging because those microaggressions are sort of confirming this stuff for you. Like, if someone mansplains to me how to do my job, then if they do it enough times, I start to think, maybe I don't know how to do my job. And then I freak out and worry about going into work. And this happened. I was worried about going into work for like three months because I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing, what's happening. But then I learned that imposter syndrome is a real thing, and it made me feel better. I went and I told my friends, like, oh, I feel hopeless, but there's a word for it, so it's okay now. And it actually helped. And imposter syndrome's t tricky, and sexism is tricky, and all of this is so complicated. And that's why we have feminism to, to battle it, essentially. And I know feminism is a big word. I'm going to try not to talk too much about it because that is a whole talk on its own. This is kind of Feminism 101 secretly. <laughs> but uh, feminism, for the sake of this talk, it's treating coworkers like coworkers. It is, I mean, in the greater scope of things, it's treating people like people. And it's nothing to be afraid of. It's not an insult. It's something to own and be proud of. I mean, by all of you being here, you're a part of the feminist movement, and that's huge. It's it's huge. It's really cool. It's really powerful. It's something to own. And when we talk about feminism, I mean, you know that there's like men and women, but there's another part of gender that's cis and trans, which is kind of its own thing, but it's worth talking about for lots of reasons. Um, so cis and trans is like when i mean they're chemistry terms cis is to stay on the same side of trans is to be on opposite sides of so let's say you're born come out your mom doctor slaps you on the butt says it's a boy so your assigned sex is male that's that's the side of the track you're starting on you go through life you identify as male you perceive the world as male your, your identity and your assigned sex are on the same side that makes you cis male doesn't mean you're inherently sexist or bad or anything. It's just the term for it. And likewise, on the other side of the world, or the gender world, um, if you come out your mom, doctor slaps you on the butt, says it's a boy, your assigned sex is male. You go through life, you don't identify as a male. You don't see the world as a male. You identify as a female. That makes you trans female. Also just makes you female. The only reason I'm really bringing this up is because not all women are cis, so if you want to be an ally to all women, you have to keep that in mind. And all of this builds up to how we can do ally work to make the world a better place, essentially. And that's the last term that I would like to talk about is ally, which is a big term. The main thing I want to say about ally is that it's not an identity. It's not like, oh, I identify as female, I identify as an ally. It's like uh, a verb, it's what you do. Ally is like if you're going to work and you notice the accessibility button is broken. It's not a button you usually use, but it's not working, the door doesn't automatically open. So doing ally work would be going inside, picking up the phone, calling building management facilities, whomever, and saying, hey, this button is broken, and taking the steps to actively get this fixed. That is doing ally work. If a tree falls in the woods and doesn't make a sound, or doesn't make a sound, whatever, yes. If an ally does work and no one sees it, it's, it's still ally work. It's still good. It's still important. It's just making the place better for other people. So that's a lot of words. What does this actually look like? The most common form of mansplaining is interrupting. If you take anything away from this talk, the most important thing you can take away is to watch how often you interrupt people. The most important thing that you can take away from this talk is to watch how much you interrupt people. When someone interrupts me, that tell, even if it's to say the exact same thing that I'm about to say, it tells me that they, whatever I have to say doesn't matter, that it's not important, and maybe I shouldn't have talked anyways. And it, it sucks in the most basic form. And there was a study done earlier this year where there were 83-minute conversations. And it was half men, half women. 
And the study was to see if there was a difference in how men and women speak. And there wasn't a lot of difference. The main difference was that interruptions happen, that women interrupt men once on average in those three minutes, and that they interrupt women almost three times that. So thus women also mansplain. Men interrupt men twice in those three minutes on average, and they interrupted women 2.6 times. So women get interrupted a whole lot all the time in just like those three minutes. Imagine if that's a half hour meeting. Nothing would get said, nothing would get heard, nothing would get done. And I've been in that meeting. I've been in so many of that meeting where I, I want to say something and, and, and the topic has changed by the time there's a moment for me to speak up. Or I want to say something, but there's, there's already two guys interrupting each other, and I don't know how I fit on this weird chain because I don't want to interrupt two people interrupting each other. That's just really awkward. So maybe I don't say anything. And the meeting goes by. I don't talk. And then at the next meeting, maybe I don't even want to try and talk. I mean, what's the point? I'm not going to get heard. There's no reason for me to be there. Maybe I just look at cat pictures the whole meeting instead. And I mean, it's, it's weaker. I mean, why am I in a meeting if I'm not contributing? It doesn't, it's weaker for the team, it's weaker for the meeting, it makes me dislike my coworkers. It's kind of this spiral and the imposter sy syndrome kicks in and it's a whole mess. So how do we give space for people who want to be heard, who are trying to speak up and are being silenced or just no one's there to listen? Uh, so I'm gonna talk about some basic active listening skills. And the two parts to this are listening to others and listening to yourself. Listening to others just looks like simple stuff. I mean, microaggressions are basic, so it takes basic steps to fight them. It looks like just making eye contact and nodding and asking clarifying questions and paraphrasing or confirming or saying, uh-huh. I mean, if you want someone to listen to you and take in what you have to say, you need to show that same respect. The other part to listening is listening to yourself and what language you use. I mean, we have a lot of oppressive language that we've assimilated in our vocabularies. And once you start hearing for it, it makes it easier to stop it. So for example, say women. Don't say girls, ladies, honey, sugar, sweetie, um, other sugary food, birds, chicks. Just, just women. It's pretty easy. It's treating coworkers like coworkers. You wouldn't call a guy a chick or a sugary food product. Like, why do it to women? The other part about listening to yourself. Oh, there's okay. There's two more parts. So you can correct yourself. If you hear something that, if you say something that you didn't mean that doesn't, you know, line up your intent with your impact. For example, let's say, let's say you say uh, Windows is retarded. Then you can stop yourself and say, oh, I did not mean that. I meant to say that Windows is frustrating because of X, Y, and Z. It's very easy. It's OK to backtrack. It's fine. And then if someone comes to you with, and they want to talk to you about something, about someone, and they're trusting you, there's things, right and wrong ways to handle that, like this one. <laughs> I want you to be able to come to me about things, but I think the most important thing is that you feel comfortable talking to this person directly when you have an issue. And everyone's mental response was, yes, I know. That's why I'm coming to you, because I don't feel I am capable of making any progress with this person. If someone's coming to you with an issue, don't give excuses. Don't say boys will be boys. I mean, girls will be girls doesn't fly, so why would boys be boys fly? If you don't know what to say, then practice active listening. So that's a lot of information. What are some actual tools that we can take back to the workplace to open up dialogue, to improve the everything for everyone ever? It's, it's that easy, right? Uh, let's pretend that all the tools that we have, are there's so many of them that they make a pyramid. And the top of that pyramid is one-on-one. -on -one. If you're just working with one other person at work, paired programming, what can you do? 
There's a handful of things. You can ask to drive. That is, if someone says, can you help me with my computer? You can ask permission to drive, and that means touch their computer, use it, figure out uh, if they want you to just talk them through it. Is it something that they just want you to fix for them? Do they want instructions? Are they partway through it? Just ask to figure it out so you don't mansplain all over the place. Another thing is observing. I mean, no statistic is more real than if you look at your own company. Check out your org chart. How many of your coworkers are women? What percentage of those women are technical? What percentage of those technical women have senior titles? Compare it to the men. That way you can track progress. And listen, use those active listening skills. Check out who in meetings isn't talking, who isn't speaking up. Give them space, ask if they have anything to contribute. If they don't, then why are they there? Mentoring is also really powerful. I mean, we're all told to ask lots of questions, so be someone that we can ask questions to. And if you have the time or resources, hold classes, Skillshare. I mean, Ruby, for one hour a day, once a week, it'll teach a lot of things to other people in the company, it'll strengthen everyone. It's really powerful. And be inclusive. If you want the smallest thing that you can do is if your team is going to lunch, invite each person individually. That way, no one feels like they're being dragged along. And there's also checking in. I mean, a lot of the tools I'm talking about can be equally used to oppress. So if you see that happening, uh, sometimes it's more alienating to the person, to the person being oppressed, if you speak up right then. That might be really awkward, bad thing. You know, it, it can just be really awkward. So checking in is kind of a powerful tool. Biting my tongue at something as obvious as this drives me crazy, and I don't know if I can do it again. But then again, maybe in that moment, I'll be just as afraid about my professional future, and that will be enough to keep me from saying anything. So if you see something happen, you can check in later. You can go up to the person and say, hey, I saw this incident occur. Do you want to talk about it? Do you want to check in? It's really nice. It's really polite. It's really powerful. So the middle of this pyramid is a box, apparently, full of chat rooms. No, it's how to open dialogue. It's ways to give space for people who want to talk about things. And that can look like chat rooms and email lists. Um, at my work, Puppet Labs, we have a chat room for talking about diversity and tech. On average, 10% of the company is in there. And we can talk about anything. You share articles, you can talk about what Halloween costumes are appropriate, things like that. Uh, there's also meetups. You can have women at lunch meetups. You can have uh, women after lunch meetups, after work. <laughs> it's, it helps build a safer space, helps build community. It is a way for people to meet other people on different teams. And there's good ways and bad ways to go about conflict. I mean, opening dialogue, conflict is going to happen. My old company had a boys' night and a girls' night. The guys got to actually do something fun like fishing and outdoorsy stuff. The women got their nails done. So if we apply feminism of treating coworkers like coworkers to this talk, that would look like there's a nails done night and an outdoorsy stuff night. And men can go to either and women can go to either. It doesn't matter. If you have open dialogue, you can figure out what a women's night should look like and what people actually want to attend. And the bottom of the pyramid is the foundation. So if you want, a found, you want a strong foundation, you have to check for cracks. You have to look for bad habits. If your you know, workplace is accessible according to whatever laws it needs to be according to, you can hire a contractor to see if there are other ways to improve the space for people with physical disabilities. If um, You can also participate in your policies. I mean, policies aren't just for HR to write. They are actually there so that if something, if an incident happens, you have something to fall back on. Policies, you can propose your own. I mean, it takes a village to raise a startup. It's not just for HR to figure out what people need. And if you have open dialogues, then you can figure out what sort of policies need to be written. Um, for example, you can have a drinking policy to see, to create more comforting space for people who don't always drink alcohol or choose not to drink alcohol. And you want to participate in your community. 
basic. I mean, talk to people outside your team. Get to know what else is going on in the company. It's good for you. It's good for everyone. It's common sense. And conferences have their own separate foundation that are complicated. But there's a lot of cool resources out there. I mean, and there's a lot of interesting things going on. There's like anonymous talk submissions are really cool. So that if someone applies for a talk, they know that they are being picked for their topic and not because of their gendered name. Um, there's also what like live streaming, um, having captioning for live streaming so that more people have access to checking out what's going on. So this is a lot of information and pretend that these pyramids exist on the plane of education. I couldn't come up with a better metaphor than that in time. Um, but the more you know, the bigger your pyramid can be, the more tools you can have, the better you can represent, essentially. And this is a handful of resources out there. There are so many others out there. Um, Model View Culture just recently had a great issue about conferences and you know, resources for that. Um, Geek Feminism Wiki has a really good organized list of stuff. And this is all, I'll have this link up again, but this is all a little program that has these resources and more. And I'll just show you what's going on there. Um, so let's hit break. So I couldn't share all of, the result, all of the results from that questionnaire because there were so many. I put them in this program. Uh, about is just basic about how to contact me, things like that. The fact that I gave a talk in front of all of you people. Advice, conf, and UG are all responses from that questionnaire. Advice, it'll give you a random one from a text file. So advice is, the question was, if you could give advice to any woman entering the tech industry, what would you say? It's hard, but there are a lot of good people in this industry who want to learn how to be better. Don't take any shit, but look for the people who actually want to learn. Build relationships with female coworkers. Try not to fall into the trap of seeing them as enemy competitors. Mentor and seek out your own mentors. Conf is uh, microaggressions and experiences at conferences and meetups. I was constantly singled out by women who can't code, who wanted me to go talk at other women to tell them to go to STEM fields, and ultimately trying to guilt me into spending a lot of time doing non-tech volunteering strictly because of my biological gender and field of study, rather than interest or aptitude. And the last one, UG, is your run-of-the-mill microaggression. Lots of inappropriate joking in the office, discussing new applicants based on their cup size rather than qualifications, only reviewing women for certain positions and men for others. Nothing that is outright harassment, but lots of things that scream sexism. If you really want to, you can open up the text files and just read all of them. It's really depressing, though. <laughs> the advice one isn't as depressing. Um, and the other part of this program is the learn. So there's audio which is audio and visual conferences and sites. And if you type one in, it'll just pop up a random. So this is an article from Bitch Magazine with studies about mansplaining and talks about Kanye and Taylor Swift. <laughs> and you can also, there's a whole text file of just websites. So gitlab.com slash Marnie slash mansplaining. I have it written on little scratch paper that I will leave over by the water if you want. I have it on business cards if you want to talk to me. It'll be on the last slide, too. So we've talked about a lot. Uh, we've talked about semantics, the language we use when talking about oppression, how microaggressions are basic, and imposter syndrome is a damage multiplier once microaggressions get you down, and ally is a verb. It's not an identity. We've talked about syntax, how to line up your intent with your impact, and to watch your interruptions and your language. And we've talked about how to apply open source ideologies to the community of feminism, how to add to it. I mean, the tech world is all about innovation, so how can we improve feminism in our own backyard? And there's a lot of opportunities for women to enter tech and learn about things, and there's only more and more opportunities out there, so let's make it a nicer place to be. Done. Uh, <laughs> I, don't know, do I, have time for okay. I think I have time for questions, if they're short questions.
If they're long questions, just email me, Marnie at Puppet. I can zoom this slide in. That's fine. Yeah. Oh, no, there. Nothing. No questions. Those two. OK. OK, so uh, the content was, was wonderful. Like, there's a lot there that I, as a guy, didn't know. I didn't know all the details of mansplaining, things like that. Oh. And I and other guys I know are often afraid to ask, why is this mansplaining? You just told me something I said is mansplaining. Why is it mansplaining? Because we're afraid that if we ask that, it's going to make us seem like we're being aggressive or that other people are going to turn around and say, you just don't understand, you just know privilege, now we're going to shoot you down. And it's just, it explodes into this, this huge mess I mean, without anyone intending it to start that way. How can we get to the point where men who genuinely want to help and learn more about this can openly ask questions so that we can all join in and you know, make, make this better for Totally. Um, so for anyone who didn't hear, the question was uh, essentially how can men have open conversations about this without being shut down by feminism? Yeah. You know. Yeah. Totally. Um, I think it's still important to try and ask. I know a lot of coworkers um, who can be afraid to talk about this stuff. I mean, it is daunting. It is a different world. If you really don't know and are really like not sure if something okay, you can email me. I won't be offended by anything if unless you're trying to offend me, in which case I won't reply. I mean, you feel free to run it by me, and I can tell you. <laughs> I, I can be your personal checker. Um, but it's worth asking. As long as you say, you know, I'm coming from this place where I don't understand this. Can you explain this to me? Like, just yeah, yeah. Hope that helps. <laughs> cool. Anyone else? Yeah? I'm sorry, can you speak a little louder? That one's tricky. I've been practicing this in front of my coworkers, and I think that's been helping, honestly. <laughs> um, really just talking about it. If you find articles about interruption studies and share them with coworkers, and they start to kind of get that in. If you just talk to coworkers like, hey, I saw this thing, and people interrupt so much more than I thought they did. Like, that kind of starts a dialogue and gets people to keep it in their subconscious. Kelsey, what's up? So, um, I'm a minority in tech, if you haven't noticed. And sometimes people ask a question like, what's the end game? Right? So, um, if I were to review like, the civil rights movement, there was a clear end game. If this were to happen, then we know our cause is done. And I think they know. So, think about that for a second. What would be something where you would walk into an office place in tech and say, there's no work to do? That would be cool. Um, that actually, the book about the book called Men Explain Things to Me, the last chapter is all about like that and how it doesn't end, essentially. I mean, I can't picture a world where it ends. If it did, then it would look like 50%, uh, roughly 50% of the technical people at my work would be female. Then, then I would be like, all right, I, I'm content for now. <laughs> Um, back there. Uh, so, um, I heard a, sort of a conflicting feedback about my team where there was only one woman on our team. So, uh, she did not want to have special treatment. We treated differently. But, sort of naturally, when we guys treated each other normally, she also felt like she has to fit in and she can't be herself. 
Um, I mean, it's hard to figure that stuff out. I go through the same thing where sometimes I want to fit in and be one of the guys, and other times I'm like, well, but I'm not a guy. Um, and it's tricky. The best you can do is just ask and listen and check in. Those are, like, the main um, points. I mean, if I can't speak specifically for that coworker because I don't know her, but make sure that if she wants to speak up about how she's being treated, that there's room for it. I know it's really vague, but... Way in the back. Um, what advice do you have for opening up a dialogue at work? Because like, I feel like sometimes I won't make reference to things that are in bias or things like that. And all of the men around me won't touch it because it's like the third rail. Like, if you touch it, you will die. How do you get past that sort of initial and not wanting to admit that these things are real? That's hard. I mean, it's, it's definitely hard. I'm still working on figuring that out. I think that, honestly, adding a chat room, like we use HipChat, so I added a diversity and check chat room, and that has really helped um, just for sharing articles and stuff. I also, while working on this talk, I would put drop little links about uh, feminism in my progress reports. I'd just be like, oh, here's an interesting article about women in tech. Did you guys read this? And like little things, just like hints until they find one that clicks with them and then a conversation can finally start. Yeah, no questions about the men's right movement. That was what I was worried about. <laughs> okay, am I out of time yet? Oh, no, I'm done. If that's okay, thanks. <laughs>